So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, let me do a little bit of housekeeping and then uh, some, some introductions and then we'll get going. So I just clicked the uh, record button. Uh, we're gonna record the session. Um, just to let, let everyone know. Um, I also wanted to ask those people who are um, attending and who are uh, interested in doing so to put your name and affiliation in the chat so that the way that webinars work is different than Zoom meetings and that you don't see who else is there unless, unless you sort of identify yourself through chat. So it's just a nice way to let other people know that you're there. Um, and uh, I also wanted to explain the uh, Q&A process from the Q versus the chat. The chat function is the ability, gives you the ability to talk to everyone who's attending. Um, the Q&A process is a little bit different, if, and, and that's where we want you to put your questions uh, to engage in the, the conversation with the, with the two panelists. Um, so when you enter your Q&A question, only we will see those, only the three of us will see that question. Um, once the question is addressed, you will be able to see it either in the dismissed area or in the answered area. I actually would, would encourage our two panelists not to answer them because it's harder to follow that way um, in writing. Um, and instead, we'll answer them um, as part of our discussion and then move them over to the dismissed area where everyone will be able to see the questions that are asked. Don't worry, by the way, if, if, I don't, don't think, I gosh, I wonder whether someone else might have already asked this question. If so, we'll take care of that on this end. Um, we can see them all. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, so uh, with that, I want to uh, introduce our two panelists. Um, Michael Apple will uh, speak first. Each, each, each uh, Michael and Francesca will both speak for about five minutes and then we'll sort of engage in a in a freewheeling discussion. So um, Professor Michael App Apple is the John Bascom Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at, uh, and Educational Policy Studies at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's written extensively on the politics of education reform and on uh, the relationship between culture and power and on education for social justice. Um, and uh, so much more, I could go on. Um, I, I'm trying to keep these very brief. So Professor uh, Francesca Lopez, uh, formerly of University of Arizona, is now the Waterbury Chair in uh, Equity Pedagogy at Penn State University. And um, her work focuses on the ways uh, the educational settings promote uh, achievement for marginalized youth. Um, she has a PowerPoint that she'll be sharing the screen for, Michael doesn't. Uh, so we're gonna have Michael jump in and um, just speak for a while. Just it's something we discussed as we were um, um, waiting for all you to arrive is that this, this conversation is really meant to be um, broad and to rely on two very wise and thoughtful people to uh, explore this issue of what happens when schools close down, what happens when schools aren't available, both sort of the, the lessons we learn and the consequences we experience. So, Michael. Thank you. First of all, let me thank both you and the other people who are here that we start out by disrupting what we're doing. Uh, this is a tragic time. And for me personally, as the parent of an African-American child who has suffered some of this himself, um, this then gets to be something that it is just hard for me not to get very emotional. Uh, emotional not knowledge is exactly the way one should respond to this in some ways. It is real, it is vicious, it is painful. So, so thank you, Kevin, for starting that way. I want to just lay out a series of brief arguments um, and then turn it over to Francesca and then we'll enjoy the uh, conversation. But let me start off by reminding us, let's not romanticize schools. There are reasons for our criticisms. They are part of the racial and gendered and class state. But I'm always reminded that we should respect, you'll forgive these words since they're polarizing our enemies. 
there must be a reason that the right is so damn angry at us, that those of us are engaged in doing critical work, critical policy work, critical teacher education, uh, all of that. There must be a reason, and that is because schools are also sites of victories, not just defeats. And anyone who thinks that they, that, you know, teachers and others are puppets is not paying attention. And perhaps you should go to school and be with people, not simply do the gaze of looking at them, okay? So I want us to remember that there are gains. And one of the things we should be focusing on when we're talking about schools is schools as contradictory sites. So there are losses that are going on, major ones, and uh, I'm certain that other members of the panel next time about what's happening to kids, what happens to parents, and what happens especially in the gender and class and race specificities of this that we can spend a good deal of time on that. But I, I don't want to focus on that. Other people will. I want to focus on some changes in political economy, on the ways in which curricular knowledge gets marginalized as part of what I want to call an epistemological war on certain kinds of knowledge, on what's happening uh, with the growth of homeschooling and how that changes our ideas about democracy. So let me begin. One of the things we're seeing is a major shift in the political economy of publishing and the political economy of curriculum. So as an example, um, increasingly as schools become closed and media and digital learning, at least the supposed learning are going on, it's clear that, that schools which are becoming sites of profit for large publishers anyway, and for managerial impulses, that the home itself is becoming a site of profit. And it's becoming a site of profit in a number of ways. One is uh, the ways in which schools themselves are purchasing things uh, now that are being used as the curriculum in schools, but now in the home. And that parents are spending vast amounts of money buying supplementary material right now to keep up with what is going on. So we're seeing schools becoming literally sites of commodification and the curriculum itself becoming increasingly commodified. Um, now that is very dangerous in terms of the way, the kinds of knowledge that Francesca and I and many, many others throughout the world think is important for kids to know, especially given what's happening in terms of marginalized people simply being killed. That's part of the American discourse. That is, the bodies themselves are under threat. So what this means powerfully is that parents are now increasingly fleeing the for-profit virtual schools, increasingly, and that the curriculum itself is being transformed into a commodity that is very different in some ways. And it's part of what I call an epistemological war. That knowledge which is easily commodified which is safe, which can be tested, even though many publishers and school systems are fleeing the testing, rightly so. Um, that knowledge is seen as legitimate knowledge. That knowledge that requires interaction, that requires that students talk back about their hopes and fears about their community's histories gets lost. Now that involves the de-skilling of teachers. That is those skills that teachers are beginning to learn through the work of Francesca and others, um, where teachers are finding the skills powerfully that enable them to connect to marginalized groups, to um, the groups that have been seen as the other, that those, that knowledge itself is then marginalized. Um, and when it is incorporated, such as community arts, et cetera, in STEM, it is seen simply to be used only for the benefit of profit maximization uh, to help capital, okay? So this epistemological war becomes part of the hidden cost of this and teacher skills, which is a bit like knitting or playing basketball. Uh, if you hurt yourself and you haven't knit for months, and suddenly you try and make a sweater, it feels odd. And it has taken years, almost centuries for teachers to understand how one connects with the lived experiences, hopes and hidden histories 
of indigenous groups and marginalized groups. And now, just as we are beginning to make gains, those skills are no longer required. Now, part of this as well, we're beginning to see, is not just the home as a, sort of prof, uh, as a site of profit, uh, but also the growth increasingly of homeschooling and the creation of gated communities. Now, about 10 years ago, at a meeting of this group, I proposed that one of the things we should pay much more attention to is homeschooling, that that would become the largest school reform within the next decade. I'm afraid I've turned out to be right. Um, now, homeschooling, about 80% of homeschoolers are doing so for ultra-conservative religious and cultural reasons. Um, They're creating a gated community in which democracy and what counts as official knowledge is being transformed. So there's two ways of thinking about democracy, thin and thick. Thin democracy is what we call possessive individualism. It's a democracy that says whatever can be marketized is through choice processes, whether they're neo vouchers and Kevin's work or just simply vouchers and choice plans. That is true democracy. So the only political act is voting. Um, what we're seeing now with the rapid growth of homeschooling and the normalization of homeschooling is a change from thick to democratic forms where schools become sites in which communities can form to simply schools being what parents choose. Now that is a major shift in our fundamental understanding of what democracy is like. And that shift is a major ideological shift. And it, it's involved again with the creative of gated communities where you are not at all with people who are, you would normally call the other, religiously, ethnically, in terms of gender relations, et cetera. Now that lived experience then transforms and makes it even more likely that people will see the immigrant, the racialized other as simply being the other, capital O. And that becomes crucial because now we have to think about not just political economy, but the ways in which not having school, flawed as the institution is, is actually a site in which experiments are going on where people are spending an immense amount of time and martyring themselves, communities, parents, teachers, activists, in transforming the word we, which is the most dangerous word in the English language. We is a term of exclusion as well as inclusion. And to the extent that students and parents do not act to reform the we bodily, then the we is limited. Okay. Now, in saying this, I want to say two other things and then I'll stop. Um, one of the things we know, unfortunately or fortunately, is that teachers and other educators do not change schools. They are not leaders, they are participants. One of the things we know from the history of social mobilizations is that it is social mobilizations and social movements that transform our institutions. And when teachers are isolated in their own homes with all of the gendered specificities of that with caring for your own children, if you have them, as an example, it cuts down the possibility of forming stronger unions, of building mobilizations. And the same thing is happening with parents. So parents who are with their children every day, if they are lucky enough to not have to leave because of paid work, um, then it is much harder for them to form counter hegemonic mobilizations and movements as well. Now, in the face of this, some counter hegemonic stuff is going on. And this is my last point. We are seeing remarkable stuff around things we never thought about before. Schools didn't give kids only knowledge, good knowledge, depending on what it was. They fed them. And that is no longer possible. That is no longer there. Yet teachers are working with minoritized and poor communities now jointly in learning how to work together on feeding children. That seems like such a small thing, but it's what I call a non-reformist reform. 
a door that can be opened in which people, even in the face of this desocializing experience, are re-socializing in terms of building the possibility of joint work between communities, parents, and teachers. So I see this as a mixed contradictory form, but those are the kinds of things I'm beginning to focus on right now. So I apologize for going two minutes over, but uh, thank you. And I'll turn it over to uh, one of my teachers, Francesca. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. Uh, I was also gonna start out by saying, I think it's really important um, to point out that we have struggled to ensure access to high quality education. Like one of the guiding questions we had was how do we ensure that in this remote situation, we can ensure access. Um, and we have struggled with that, we continue to. And yet, yes, there have been victories. Um, but taking us back to when this was all unfolding when I was still in Arizona, there was a superintendent of the second largest school district in Arizona who said during a school board meeting in March, when they were discussing the, the reallocation of funds in the budget after they conducted a survey and discovered there were households across the district, no surprise, that did not have the digital access to continue instruction, not only with families, but with teachers, close to 1,000 teachers. So they were reallocating funds in the budget to purchase 25,000 devices for students and teachers to have access. Um, and his comments during the meeting was that this pandemic just simply cracked open the digital divide that has been there all along. Um, soon after that, when I was again still in Arizona, we sent out a survey to all the teachers across the state. Um, this was again in March, right as the pandemic shifted everything to remote instruction. It happened around spring break. Um, we received about 1,300 responses and some of the key takes, takeaways of this survey was that in the highly dense Latinx context and or context where many of the students or most of the students met criteria for free and reduced lunch. In those spaces, that's where teachers really reported that students' needs were not being met. And they were specifically talking about students classified as English learners and students who had an IEP. Um, no surprise, the teachers overwhelmingly reported that they didn't even have the training on how to use this available technology to be effective at a distance, right? And so the state did have some boot camps, what they called boot camps to provide training, but this is on top, right, of all the things teachers were balancing in addition to households where they also had school-aged children at home, right? And so this, the image I wanted to share, um, here we go, is a photo that a friend of mine sent me. Hopefully everybody can see that. And she sent it to me yesterday um, saying of her four-year-old daughter, and I did get permission to share. She said, this is how I'm feeling right now as I'm preparing to go into an all day of Zoom meetings. And I couldn't help but look at that image and think, what are we doing to our kids, right? Um, I, I'm in a household where I do have a school-aged child and I'm very much living this binary existence. And this is a household in the image and my own with resources, right? So I, for me, the concern is really, how are we tra trying to translate what happens in brick and mortar schools and assume that you can do this on a digital platform without it being a big mess, right? Um, we're seeing some things translate, discipline being one of them. This is one example of many with all the cases I've seen are black boys being suspended because a teacher happened to see a BB gun or a toy gun in the background. So I, I'm very deeply concerned about this literal translation of what happens in these spaces now going, you know, in this remote world. Um, you know, that said, I have seen, I have been very worried prior to the pandemic. Personally, what I had witnessed the more I read about it is how school lunch debt across our nation um, and the lunch shaming that was going on with students was this issue that needed a national solution. Children showing up and not having enough funds right in, in their lunch account would be given some kind of sandwich if they were given anything at all. Lunches would be thrown away. I mean, it's, it's 
catastrophic that our spaces in schools, earlier today's panel, um, someone mentioned that schools are supposed to be in local parentis. And when it comes to these kinds of needs, like feeding, it's a huge issue. But with the pandemic, it's one of the things that I think we've learned where, at least in some spaces, I don't know if it's carried across throughout the nation, where the USDA has kind of lifted in, in, in ways that I never even anticipated this flexible free lunch program for children. Um, what I'm showing on the screen right now is an excerpt from an email I received because the school district was receiving a lot of questions like who is eligible because there was no eligibility criteria. And they were even asking us, there's a benefit for you to participate. We don't care who participates. Our school is funded through meal sales. When you participate, it's providing funding and wages for staff. And I found this to be, imagine if all our spaces for school were like this, this philosophy. Um, because the resources tend to follow certain students and not others. And this is where we tend to see this, this inequity, having to call on the, on the goodwill of individuals to want to participate in certain schooling spaces. And here's a situation where no questions asked, please participate, it helps our schools. Um, I found that to be such a lesson, but I, I haven't really seen it played up much. Um, so it's really interesting to me. Now, Michael brought up some points, um, and I was going to wait to mention them, but I just think they're very important because I think the online experience has, in my mind, been an utter failure and catastrophe. Um, as having a, a college-age son who was in the dorms and University of Arizona shut down, transported him from dorm to dorm, and he shows up on our doorstep one day in tears because it was such a miserable experience for him. He is not built for online. And it was, it was just, it was very heart-wrenching to see what he went through. And he swore he was not going to go back to college until it was ensured that it could be face-to-face. -face. But not too long ago when I had been asked to participate in this panel, I was having a conversation with him. His name is Javier, he's 20. And we were talking about public schools. All my children have gone to public schools. And he tells me, I, mom, you know, I don't think I really learned that much in school. Now I can think of many examples where this is absolutely false, right? That's me. Um, but his perception is that, no, I didn't learn much. And this is an image. He's right there studying with a bunch of friends. He told me, mom, it's social. It's social. That's what I got out of it. So I was listening to him and I think it's important to say about Javier, this is a child who was labeled English learner. It haunted him, and I do mean haunted him, because when we moved from Wisconsin to Arizona, it haunted him. Um, it was not a space where equity was, was really at the, at the helm of why children are labeled. Um, but for him, the socialization saved his life in many, many ways. This is a child who did not get good grades, who did not feel like many boys, right? Don't feel school is for them. Was not a stellar student, didn't expel, get expelled. It wasn't, wasn't that child in that trajectory. But his most momentous times, I mean, what I look back on his public school opportunity that I think cannot be captured in this remote situation that we're in, um, there's this notion that I, I know our next panelists are going to discuss, you know, when school's out, education might suffer less than we think, but I know that that's really contingent on resources, right? This is Alfie Cohn's comments. When the learning is meaningful to begin with, it doesn't slip away. But that hit home for me because of his in-person experience. So he ended up, because of an English teacher, his senior year, being asked to join the academic decathlon team. They took first place nationally. All the kids got scholarships, four-year scholarships in Arizona to any of the state schools. This is a kid who was not an academic kid. And yet he became part of a community because one teacher found something in him that knew that the team needed. And this is an image of a school board meeting that is their academic decathlon teacher, Mr. Yetman. And what you'll see in the audience is they're all wearing red. This is during the Red for Ed movement in Arizona. 
they are all there for their teacher, all the students you see in that audience. And it says Arizona Educators United on the front and on the back, it says I'm here for Mr. Yetman. And they stood up and spoke to the school board about their teacher and why it was so important, right? To, to value our teachers. Um, so some other images where he looks back on his memory on schooling being social. And yes, it's very social. I'm sure a lot of us have these memories, but it made him an activist. And that is something that I don't know how we replicate in the situation that we're in. So um, I'll stop there because I'm sure I've been all over the place, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so I see a question in the chat from Michael Barber, but before getting to that, I want to see if, if either one of you had, had um, like responses to what each other said. I know Francesca, you already responded a little bit to what Michael said. Um, so the, the question from uh, Michael Barber is, how much of that translating school context to remote context is the simple fact that teachers and school leaders just don't understand or have any context of what effective online learning and online learning programs actually look like. I mean, if you don't know what it should look like, you try to make it look like what you do know. So the, I think Francesca, you in particular said, you see it as a miserable failure, what we went to. Maybe I added the miserable part, but I certainly see it as a failure what we went to. Um, is, do you think that's, that's necessarily the case, and um, are we are we making any progress? Well, to that question, I mean, I you know, pulling from the survey that we did in Arizona, absolutely, they they had. I agree, right? Part of it is they don't know what it should look like, but we've had so many forces, right, trying to pitch online schooling, and those have not been very successful. Um, I, I think I'm struggling because if all we see school spaces as is spaces for learning, I, I think we're missing the, the, the takeaways I have that they're spaces for, as Michael talked about, the we, but the we that's inclusive and being with others and the social connections that it's, I have not seen them replicated online. Um, and I don't know that you can replicate. I, I'm not convinced that we can replicate them online, but I don't know. Let me say one thing just to follow up on Francesca's points. We need to think relationally about this. Look, the, the mere, I, I agree that there can be things that can be done with digital forms that are absolutely brilliant, brilliant. Uh, and I agree that by and large, the way we use the information is not the best in the world, to say the very least. However, when we open a door, we're not the only people who walk through it. So let, let me uh, give an example of this. Okay? So um, in one of the school districts near Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I'm from right now, um, they have purchase this entire management system that comes with some incredibly responsive things about tracking kids' progress um, in ways that are not simply diminishing kids' voice. I mean, it's very interesting stuff, but at the same time, part of that program has given the school board and the administration the ability to track the keys, the keys that any teacher will, will use on the computer. Now that's the one that many of the administrators thought was really, really interesting. And there was one teacher who was one of, one of her children and one of the kids in her class, her mother had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. So she was helping the child on the computer typing in breast. And within one day, you can imagine what happened. I don't mean this to be cute. I want us to, it's a slightly grotesque example and a very painful one. But it's also the case that unless we put in mechanisms 
that say that the good uses, the creative uses of these new technologies are the ones that will be used, purchased, played with creatively, we will lose. On the history of capital, for instance, is the history of technical innovations that can be used powerfully, but not always for good. Yeah. So in my mind, what we always want to ask is what are the contradictions in these things? Who will use them? What, what's the flow of this river right now? And it's towards efficiency, cost cutting, et cetera. It is not towards the use of these things in the way that the designers actually thought. Yeah. So again, I want us to be a bit more cautious, but not to be neo-Ludites, not to throw the stuff out. <laughs> yeah, uh, it reminds me of some comments that um, that my colleague Bill Penuel made early, earlier on, I think it was probably around May, I think we published a newsletter. Um, we basically said this is an opportunity for us um, to rethink some things in a positive way. Um, and I think it's happening, right? It's, it's, it's a vast country. <laughs> there are places where, it, where it really, where we can look to, to wonderful examples, but as a whole, it doesn't feel that way. Um, in, in our um, question and answer, there are some questions directed to each one of you. <laughs> Francesca, do you see the first one there? I think I did, is it from Michelle? Yeah, so can yeah. you speak more to the different uh, incidents of the school to prison pipeline being translated to the home? Are you seeing more beyond that Colorado Springs case that you, that you mentioned with the, with the kid with the toy gun? Oh yeah, absolutely. There was one, and I don't know if the incident just occurred, but I just saw it and it was in New Orleans. Um, and I think there have been a few others. And it's interesting because I feel like part of that disparity comes with, again, the translation of what's happening in the school spaces to the virtual spaces with that kind of vigilant accountability um, that seeps in because in some school spaces, what I had been seeing is for teachers to understand and in order for equity to be really key in their practices to not demand that students show their, their, their faces because of whatever reasons that the family might want privacy, right? That there are certain things that you can do to make those spaces more conducive without having a checklist on you know, ways that behaviorally they're, they're not doing what they're supposed to, right? And again, drawing on my own experience, my daughter did not have to have her, her screen on. And she was actively participating in the classes. This was again, back in the spring, but I've heard a lot in conversations with school leaders. I mean, that is something that it's problematic because it's the assumption and yet there's no consideration that you are no longer in a school classroom you're in somebody's home. And often people are sharing digital devices and people are, if they're working there, it's just not conducive, right, to that kind of space to have the same set of rules that you would expect in a school that aren't really rules, you're present. Um, so I think that's why we are seeing more of that. It's just this literal translation of, I'm gonna have rules and people are gonna follow them and that's what that looks like. Michael, there's a question there that you probably saw, but I'll, I, there are actually, I think, two questions that are, that are best directed to you. Um, there's one that Bill Mathis just added here about um, how, thinking about how artificial intelligence is gonna play out in the long run um, as we move more to these technologies. I could, I, I could see Michael Apple as having some, being someone who might have a, a view on that. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'll direct that to you. And then there's, there's also this question from Michelle about uh, the, the, you know, your framing about digital learning as, uh, in gated communities. Let me just to get, the, get them up so I... Oh, okay. So yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll, I won't worry. I'll, I'll read that one to you. But the first one is, is about the AI. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I'm not... There's a debate about AI that's quite remarkable. So I spent a lot of time in China right now. So I happen to be a professor at Beijing Normal University. Um, it's a very interesting place. I am not a romantic at all about China. And I'm certainly not a romantic about the way in which curricula and teaching is controlled over there. Okay. 
but there are critical educators in China who are fighting the good fight in many ways. And there are ministry officials who actually support it, which surprised me. I want to use China as an example. Um, so when I'm in a train station there, there are, or the airport, there are robots who come by and they will check me for COVID. And we'll also do facial recognition to find out if there's a warrant out for my arrest. Or if I am in a place that I'm not supposed not supposed to be. Okay. Now that is, in my mind, partly significantly um, a misuse of AI. But I am fascinated whenever a machine beats a human in chess. And I want to see what is possible, but I also know that the people who are funding this research are off from the military. Um, now, how does one balance that? So the space program uh, gave us the transistor, which then gave us the computer and email. Now, there's no doubt that when I am in conversation with people in Chiapas, about indigenous knowledge and its importance in the schools of that region of Mexico, that provides that technology, which is becoming quite elaborate and interesting, provides a space for work that I just want to applaud. At the same time, in the larger sphere of things, the AI is being colonized in powerful ways, in ways that I find repulsive and deeply worrisome. Okay? Now, Maybe it's because I'm in a contradictory mood right now, but the word again is what are the yeses and nos about this? So I think that there are very real possibilities with AI. Uh, I do not romanticize it at all. And again, I want us to ask, what is the balance of forces and balance of power in the use of this? If it's being used, for instance, for facial recognition, uh, when I board an airplane and I refuse to have it and they don't know whether I'm allowed then to go on the airplane, right? Then it worries me that what this is is part of a mechanism of control that removes it from its human impulses. So uh, again, I, I'm, I'm sorry with uh, uh, Bill that I can't go further than that, but the, the debate uh, right now over the impulses on this is one of the most powerful in the world, both in government and in the academy. So there are people here in philosophy department and ethics who are raising tremendously interesting questions about this. And I think it would behoove educators actually to read some stuff that may be technically difficult, you know, formal philosophical and analytic work on what, do, what are the ethics involved in the creation of knowledge that used to be private and in facial recognition technologies, just as an example. So I'll stop there. So Michael, I, I, the, the chat, the Q and A function is on the bottom of your screen, but don't worry about it, I'm gonna read, read this. So this is directed toward Michael, but I actually think both of you um, might wanna chime in on it. It, it, it concerns the, the learning pods, um, but it starts off, Michael, your framing of digital learning creating uh, gated communities resonates. It reminds me of the parable of the sower by Octavia, 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 Octavia Butler. Um, I, I am curious what you uh, think about the impact of learning pods on top of it. On the one hand, they reinforce inequality in gated communities. On the flip side, they provide some of the socializing that Francesca rightly showed was missing. Francesca, since uh, do you want to go first on this? Do you have some ideas and then I'll jump in after you. No, I, I'm pumping on you without warning. No, it's okay. I, I was kind of thinking through that question about the, the learning pods. Um, and I, somebody had asked me about them, and I honestly don't know enough to be able to say much. I, I had read an article that said, you know, they kind of perpetuate inequity. And beyond that, I don't know much. So I will defer back to you. Okay. Um, there is a, a research institute one of my favorites at the University of Barcelona called CREA, C-R-E-A. Um, and they see all, it's something I strongly agree with, that knowledge is a social product. 
and it comes out of collective deliberations that require participation and voice. It's Paolo Freire, but somewhat more practical, and it's not only for, I forgive the word only, for out of school um, oppressed communities. Um, I'm influenced strongly by that vision. And so there is no doubt in my mind that learning pods right now are the ways in which the upwardly mobile middle class protects its children. Uh, that's one of its effects that worries the hell out of me and it should worry us all. On the other hand, it does, insti it does institute an epistemological and social vision that is wise, which says this, a classroom in which kids are sitting at desks all by themselves, studying for tests, may have drawbacks to say the least, even though there are times when teachers have to talk and kids should be paying attention, right? But the idea that knowledge is a social product, that it is a result of a communicative process in which voices are cherished and respected, and there can be dissidence and conversation and participation over it, and it has to be linked to the whole group whenever possible, is wise. So can we learn from that, that there should be more social forms in classrooms? Uh, does this mean a return to John Dewey and communities? I would hope so. Um, can there be multiple things uh, in indigenous communities, for instance, within indigenous schooling and schools near, in quotes, reservations in Wisconsin? Much of the learning that goes on is not individuated, it is social. And that's something that goes on in Latinx communities. It goes on in New Mexico and Taos Pueblo. Now, so in many ways, this can open a space for the processes of knowing um, that tend to be marginalized or are recoup that can recuperate things that are now being owned and uh, by more affluent parents as a space where more voices can be heard and more kids can participate. If that's, that possibility is there, and if we use it that way, I'm strongly in favor of it. Thank you. Um, the, next, the next question uh, should resonate with both of you in terms of your work on privatization. Um, it's from Emily Hodge, professor at Montclair State. She asks, um, do you all have any predictions about who you think stands to profit from this crisis? Specific organizations, whether for or not for profit, um, or particular types of organizations. Um, so think about like digital curriculum providers, PPE suppliers, tech companies. It's interesting. I, I do think that there, there are certain um, companies that have quite a bit to gain. Um, and I say this because the same, I see them as predatory online modalities that we were seeing throughout Arizona were an option here for families who decided not to send their children um, to the hybrid version or to do synchronous learning. Um, and so they're everywhere. And I, I, I feel like this was a huge opportunity for them. But in saying that, it's, it strikes me that people are extremely unhappy. I mean, talking to leaders and teachers and families, if anything, it's, my, maybe this is just what I'm hoping happens, <laughs> is that it was an experiment. They gave it a shot because they had to, but people cannot wait to go back to the way things were in terms of being able to be face-to-face. -face. That is a prediction based on nothing but my own personal experiences. So take it for what it is. It's not very, um, yeah, I don't know, Michael, if you have another prediction. I, I agree quite strongly, you know, the predatory, like predatory lenders. This, you know, right now, for instance, uh, publishers are seeing an opportunity, especially conglomerate high tech publishers are seeing that this is the next revolution in terms of profit making. There's no doubt that that's going on powerfully so. Um, but I, I think one of the reasons I wanted us to then focus again on homeschooling is because that is now seen 
as among the most profitable things. And that will not uh, benefit just for profit uh, publishers, but religious publishers as well. So Bob Jones University, um, a very interesting place that uh, like Liberty and others prohibited interracial dating um, up until this past decade, um, also is one of the largest publishers and builders of um, homeschool material. Some of it is quite creative, some of it is student-centered, but it's, but it's biblical. So God speaks to me, but not to you, kind of vision. And one of the groups that will, uh, I think, um, become more powerful now is religious schooling, both in terms of the institutional forms, but also the homeschool forms. Uh, also, this is where Pierre Bourdieu becomes useful when we talk about class fractions, consultants, management experts, what, um, what Stephen Ball calls the new managerialists, what I call in educating the right way, um, you know, the professional managerial new middle class, these people are, will make a bundle. That is not just an economic capital, but their cultural capital will be valued. Uh, so right now, many, many schools which have already bought these management systems um, powerfully so, and they're quite expensive because then you know, it's like a new computer every four years, there's new managerial software every two years. Uh, and I think they will do profoundly well, but there's one group I think that will also benefit, which after all I've said, you may be surprised by. And oddly enough, that is how teachers will be viewed. So when I speak to friends of mine, they tell stories um, like the one that Francesca mentioned, how tough it is to deal with this. So many parents are at their wits end. Now you either go to work or you stay home if you're lucky enough to have a paid job. And for many people, they've lost their jobs and they can't always let the, young, the older daughter take care of the child which is what's happening in many, many communities, right? So given that, there are major shifts in how teachers are seen. And that I think is quite important because in the state of Wisconsin last year and the year before, there was legislation that said the following, we can change the licensing of future teachers and of teachers so that to teach elementary school, especially the primary grades, K to two, if you have a high school degree, you can be licensed. So it's profoundly disrespectful of the creative and hard work and knowledge of teachers. So I think oddly enough, paradoxically, this in the long run may benefit not necessarily the employment of teachers, but public respect for the work of teachers. And I take that as something that is actually hidden, but extremely powerful. And that needs to be worked on. We can mobilize. Does that I was ask whether you think, whether you two think that extends not just to teachers, but to public schooling as a whole. Um, a recognition, not just of, so you're focusing, Michael, on the, you know, wow, <laughs> teachers actually do have to set, have a set of skills beyond just being there in the classroom to babysit. Um, and and there, I think there's a recognition that has come up, I'm just going to throw out my view of this, that schools aren't just providing the, the core academic um, lessons that they do. I mean, there was a men you mentioned earlier, Michael, the idea of um, teachers and others banding together to make sure that families get food. Um, but schools do, do so much more than that. And I was wondering if either one of you had thoughts about the sorts of things that people are recognizing about schools uh, during this crisis, if any. Um. I had just seen a report that was done, and forgive me, I don't remember who, where it came out of, but that the majority of mental health services are provided in school settings, like the overwhelming majority. And I think- For, children, for people that age. Yes. For, for people that school age children. And I think that is a, a huge need that definitely is, is being felt for, you know, among many, many communities. I. I do think that 
there is more respect, not only for teachers, but for the role of public schools. Um, but I worry, I, I, I do think that's true, absolutely. But I, I'm really worried about the communities where because of a lack of resources, where schools have, have not been able for many, many reasons to be able to truly be equitable, that those communities are so in crisis mode. And I, I hate to use that kind of language that, I mean, we're seeing people lose their jobs. Michael mentioned that. There's an economic crisis and we had already been seeing more and more children living in poverty. And for this to then be the next thing, you know, wave, it's, it's not, it's just so complicated because there are so many needs. Households that felt like they could hold together, um, where families lost their job, are now just trying to survive. And I, there was a, an article in today's paper, it was a teacher in, in Tucson, Arizona, and they ended up contracting COVID. Long story short, they went from, you know, being able to dine out, being able to go on family vacations, to they've been in a homeless shelter for the last week. And so I, that's one example out of many, right? The economic crisis where it's no longer what do schools provide, but it's, it's far more than that. Um, and I know that's taking it to another place that you weren't really asking about. I'm hoping people by and large do see the value, you know, of public schools and in preparing for this, I, I had all, Bettina Love's comment about re-envisioning schools is one that I, it just resonated with me because I felt in many ways this could be an opportunity to truly reflect on, this is not ideal. What can we do to reconfigure those spaces to truly be inclusive? Um, but I mean, I don't know. You know, if we think to how you started today's panel, I think a lot of us are pretty heartbroken. Um, 2020 has been brutal in many, many ways. This past week has, has just been extremely difficult. So I, I think when we think of the emotional, you know, labor that this creates, I, to what extent can all families really then put their energies into thinking, let's mobilize for, for public schools. I worry about the finite resources that are left given crisis after crisis after crisis, particularly in our communities of color. So, yeah. Sorry, very pessimistic, sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> powerful. I think, I think that there are among many groups, schools will receive a bump, as it were. And it may benefit particular kinds of schools, full service schools which is, I have questions about them, um, since I'm, I prefer that they're community run. Um, but there's the, the idea that schools are now the hidden labor that goes on in schools, the emotional labor, the social labor that goes on. Um, and it also may change what is allowed in schools. An example would be this. In many states, it is illegal for a teacher to hug a child, to touch a child. Now, when kids are coming in, even later on, with, with this crisis or the health crisis somehow becomes less, kids are going to be coming in traumatized, as whole communities are traumatized right now. Uh, and what it what it may do is to provide an opportunity then for the school to be a more humane center, and that I would look forward to. But I want us to remember that this is, you know, again, this terrain of public schools is also, we're not the only ones working on it. Um, this is occupied as well by the government is bad, private is good kind of folks. And you know, Donald Trump is a product of this. He's worsening it, but he is made by these folks. And so we will be facing a fiscal crisis around schooling that will be so horrific it is hard to understand. And many of the gains that have made schools more responsive, more community-based, 
things that we just say, please expand this, um, will be harder and harder to defend. Now that means it would be smart for us to begin to envision who are the actors here. So an example would be uh, in Colorado, um, it was students who were deeply involved in mobilizations with teachers around strikes in areas near Denver. Uh, in Baltimore, it is students from the Algebra Project were deeply involved in stopping the building of another juvenile prison. So what we want to do, it seems to me, is to, yes, let's defend the public schools. Let's, um, but let's also remember that we have to connect them to other kinds of things that are important in people's lives. So the, the mass incarceration, the, you know, the, the horrible, you know, in Wisconsin, as Francesca knows, one out of every four African American and Latinx young men has been in jail or is in jail or under probation right now. So part of it is to think tactically, it seems to me, about how do you defend the school, connecting it to other issues in a community uh, in the face of a horrible economic crisis that's about, it's already started. Uh, and how do we think tactically about building alliances now that people are saying, geez, I really need the school. I'm trying to think tactically about this. Um, let me return to some of these questions uh, that uh, our attendees have asked. Um, this is from David Means, one of our colleagues here at CU Boulder. Um, do you see a role for universities and higher education in general in addressing the challenges of our current moment beyond schools of education? I'm seeing you shake your head. No, uh, Michael. Um, yes, but only <laughs> again, sort of the point I mentioned at the very beginning of my little talk, let's not romanticize uh, either schools of education, though the movements, I want to defend them right now because there's movements in many state legislatures to close them. You know, anybody can be a teacher, let's close it down. Or we'll just do teacher education, we won't do anything else. Um, so it becomes Teach for America, we'll give you six weeks of some other stuff, and then a lot of stuff on management, here you are, goodbye. Um, I think that there are ways in which we can use the, the new forms that are being talked about at universities, about um, cross-disciplinary forms, hybridized knowledge, um, as an entry point of getting people in sociology and history, in Afro-M, in um, indigenous studies, um, once you start this, I'm always afraid of saying etc. because that's a very dangerous way of looking at this, to say the least. But there are already mobilizations, uh, you know, movements that Wisconsin and Arizona and Colorado about, if we want to understand poverty, it can't be like social studies, then mathematics, then biology. We need to understand it as an interdisciplinary form that is guided by a particular politics and ethics. So I think there's a place then for expanding the interdisciplinarity at these places. And also where we act not from the School of Education, but as critical citizens at universities to defend faculty rights, faculty unions, um, greater pay and job security for the people cleaning the buildings, um, so, yeah, you know, uh, we are not the only people at work in these universities. So right now at Wisconsin, they, uh, each person who's a worker who cleans buildings at night, um, it shows you that I'm in my, was in my office too often at 10 o'clock, I'm talking to people cleaning the building, which is a damn good thing. Um, and they are almost all from outside the United States. Or 
they are the children of people who are from outside the United States. And their pay is lamentable and their working conditions are lamentable. And they now have three buildings to clean rather than one. So part of this is what can the universities do? We can do what our ethics demand, not just looking at how bad it is out there. Society isn't out there, it's right here. So we exist in Colorado or Arizona or wherever we are from in the economy. And I don't mean like the supermarket, I mean people work in these buildings, whether it's security guards or cooks, et cetera. And that requires that we mobilize, that the we be expanded in our workplaces as well. So it's not just can we use the knowledge that is so important, um, but can we use our understanding of the fragility of labor, of people losing their jobs, of going back and having their kids now having to face what we're talking about. Can we join with them in support of making the universities we work in uh, places that respond to our criticisms? And our, our words are not just verbal. There's too much critical education, it's simply words. And if we don't do it in our daily life, I tend not to trust what's going on. Francesca. So to try to add to that, I, I mean, in, in terms of the question, I had to go back in because it just, it, it took me into a lot of different places in my mind. So it was, do you see a role for universities and higher ed in general in addressing the challenges of our current moment? And I think beyond what Michael's already addressed, which is, I mean, absolutely critical. It's interesting because I think the experiences in higher ed are at a, crisis, right? And so are public schools. And I do agree that this is a wonderful moment for us to come together because we are in many ways in it together. I, I mean, if you consider, so when I was at the University of Arizona, I think some faculty jokingly, cynically said, you know, here we are, number one, because we had the highest furloughs in the nation before anybody else came out. And at the same time, I saw faculty, students, and staff, right, who are very vulnerable, mobilize and do, do incredible things to the point where they brought in outside experts to look at the budget. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned about the structure of power in institutions of higher ed, who is vulnerable, who is expendable, and there are many parallels in schools. I mean, we see that in a neighboring school district, they had about 3,000 vacancies. And at the time, the governor was saying, you had to go in person despite the pandemic or you will not receive funding. And the teacher, here again is this divide, the teachers that could afford to quit did. So here are these districts that now don't have enough teachers. I mean, so the, the same issues that we see in, in, in higher ed, it was, you know, who is expendable and all these layoffs after they had promised that there weren't going to be layoffs. I think this is a moment for us to work together because the structures are very, very similar and the outcomes are very, very similar, not only in terms of work, but the spaces that people have come to rely on. I mean, institutions of higher education have been around for a very long time for, for a very good reason. Um, public schools, I think if we look at their history, we've seen more and more closures. We've started to see a few universities close because of the pandemic. And, and I, I just think there are too many parallels for us not to think strategically about this being more of a K-20 situation rather than a K-12 and a higher education situation. Thank you. The, I have a, a question here from, um, one of our, our doctoral students, Anna Noble. Anna Noble. Um, I wonder about the use of safety in the context of a pandemic being used as a tool to exclude certain popula populations deemed unsafe. Um, or based, again, this is actually going back to the AI, or based on an AI-generated risk-based uh, uh, 
on economic status or age or similar criteria? You know, I think this, this might vary across the nation. I, I think that the districts I'm familiar with and I've worked with for a long time are communities that knew the needs of parents and in cases where even with the pandemic, they dedicated school sites so that children could go. I mean, they, schools are doing amazing things. And I, I, I know I'm talking so pessimistically and cynically, but they are, I think people in education are doing the best they can with what they have and more, right? And so I, I'm sure there are spaces where that is occurring because it's the United States and we can just look at history and why, why wouldn't we anticipate that? But I've also seen an incredible urgency by superintendents to put students and families first um, and use this opportunity in ways that they are seeing it as an opportunity. Um, one district, and this is where technology, I think, is, has been wonderful. So I'm working with a district in California um, because they, they are really committed to trying to address inequities. And it would not have been possible without technology to be engaged. And thanks to this technology, I join different meetings. I join principal meetings, I join community forums. So I'm, thank goodness, we're where we are technology-wise to be able to do that. Um, but back to the question, I, you know, yes, I think that's happening. Michael might have a more insightful answer for that. But what I've seen is the opposite, is that they knew the needs of their families. And so they did everything they possibly could. Now, in one case, they were testing, they identified COVID, and they had to reconfigure, right? Because it started spreading, as it does. You know, you bring people together and, and this is what happens, especially in hot spots like Arizona that opened up way too early. Um, but I have not seen that. I, I don't know, Michael might have more insight. I don't think I have more insight. Um, I can <laughs> channel my uh, younger son, who's a school principal in Iowa, a relatively large high school. Um, he is going crazy right now, in part because he would want to put students and families first. The governor has said, unless you're there in person, we will not fund you. And if you then deny that and you keep doing it, the students will be at risk because we will not give them credit for the courses that they're taking. So given that, many parents whose children have tested positive for COVID are sent to school. So this gets complicated by, you know, you, parents have, fun, have needs, some of them driven by sort of right-wing populist impulses that say, this is not a real crisis, or my kid never, my kid, she never even has a cold, so I'll send her to a place to go, like school, um, to other parents saying, well, we need, you know, our kid is on the cusp of getting into university, perhaps. Uh, we never finished secondary school. Our kid needs these credits to graduate. So the hell with safety. There's, I understand this. I'm first generation finishing secondary school in my family. Um, and uh, you know, when the person from Montclair State raised the question, my eyes lit up because I went to Patterson State and then Glassboro State Teachers College for my undergraduate work and taught in Patterson. So, so yeah, there's the New Jersey sort of gritty bullshit that works through me that says, you know, sort of, sort of the memory of what it's like to be born poor. And for many people, the issue is it's safety, but it's configured in such complicated ways with so many things that are so important simultaneously. So I can't answer the question in part because right now my head is going like this as I try and figure out what is an appropriate response. Do I want to criticize the parents for doing it? Of course. But if Michael is honest about 
what's working through me and my memories of what it's like to be poor, uh, or only being able to go to night school because we couldn't afford anything and would I even get into night school? So all of that is working through me right now. I'm sorry to be a little avuncular and, uh, and tell personal stories, but this is a personal, it, these are not easy questions because of that. So. When there's a, um... One of, one of the, the features that we know from all sorts of parental choice issues, everything from uh, choice-based tracking systems to interdistrict choice to a lot of the more sort of privatizing choices that we see now, is that we oftentimes end up in a situation where kids' opportunities to learn are determined by the efficacy of their parents in working a system. Um, and so this crisis, it seems, has no matter, I mean, the, I didn't know about the situation in Iowa you just described, Michael, but I mean, one of the other features I'm going to guess is happening is that more efficacious parents then opt out of that mandate through either homeschooling or private schooling. Um, you know, well, I, well, that's not what I want, so I'm just going to go buy it on the private market. Um, so, so that the and the other kids are sort of forced into the default, right, when they don't have those opportunities, those choices. Um, and we're seeing it, I mean, the mention of uh, the pods earlier, um, I mean, there are so many different ways that that's happening. Um, I, don't, I don't even know, I don't know if there's a question there. <laughs> Just sort of, <laughs> I'm sort of diverted by the, by the, by the topic, it's sort of st struck, I guess, by what's, I don't, is, is what's happening in Iowa common across the country? I wasn't aware of anywhere else where that's happened. But. I, don't, I don't know. Um, I know that Iowa, the many school districts are going crazy about it because it keeps changing. Okay. So at first it was, we want hybrid. Um, then it was, well, we have, we're a hot spot. And then we have to go all online and then governor responds. Uh, and because of the presidential elections coming up, um, you have to show at the very top that the governor and the, the state legislator level and the senatorial and representative elections that you're, you're with our beloved Miss Emperor Trump. Okay? So um, this could change. But right now it is, uh, you know, every two weeks there's new rules coming out. That is, you know, we, we went through uh, t over two and a half hours of these panels without mentioning that name. So you just blew it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, actually, my, my question is a nice segue to, another, to a question uh, asked by uh, Anna Deese, another one of our doctoral students. Uh, what does or should effective schooling look like uh, in a pandemic? Right, so I sort of was dismayed by what, what Iowa was doing, but what, what should effective schooling look like in a pandemic? Can schools even do it without stronger support from the, broad, uh, from the broader community and government? Uh, are there any places doing it right, perhaps rural or remote or isolated communities that have had uh, to use technology for schooling for quite a while? Wow, there's so much in that question. I, I'm sure there's places that are doing, I, and I said it before, I, I think places are doing the best they can with what they know and, and the resources they have. Um, it, it's difficult for me to imagine that we can imagine a, a, an ideal remote situation because I do feel so much of what public schools provide is social. I mean, it's not just the math and, the, you know, social studies and science. It's it's being with others and learning with people and disagreeing and um, discussions very much like we are having here. And so how we replicate that in, in a virtual way, I, I see the, the technology we have is augmenting that, but to replace it or imagine that it's being done ideally, I have a very hard time imagining that that's the case. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, let me remind you of something I said earlier. The right wouldn't be so angry right now if there weren't victories. So obviously there must be places that are doing things that we, that we would say that's serious, that's educative. 
Um, and we can talk about it in political terms, it's counter hegemonic, or we might just wanna say, that's really good education. So it would be smart for us to learn how to talk where we're not quoting from Foucault at every moment, but that's a different issue. I want to, there, there are places that are trying to answer this. So one of my favorite things that I know that Kevin and uh, Francesca and others know of, the latest issue of Rethinking Schools is on teaching and learning in the pandemic. It's a double issue, it's quite long, and it is teachers and academics and students and activists saying, this is what we're doing. That's actually very important because the, um, the, uh, it is so easy to become cynical to say schools can't change unless the larger society changes. Now, that's why I wanted to stress when the question was about universities, not just schools of education, can they do something? And I said, well, that is the economy right there. Um, people work there. I work there. We all work there. So this, this myth that I think provides us with a cute way of not doing anything um, that says, you know, we are thoroughly determined institutions. The pandemic controls us. The technology controls us. We can't do anything now because the, we just are mirrors of the larger society. The larger society is the assemblage of all these institutions. We happen to be in one or many of them, from the family and the home to the school, to co-ops, to all kinds of things. And working in schools, struggling over those during a time of pandemic, and then changing the rules of tenure at some universities that says narratives of success, research with, not just on, is deserving, so you change we struggle over the reward structures at these places so that people say, that's what it looks like. So part of the task, I think, is stuff that we actually can do, which is to say, here is what's going on. Let's not romanticize it. Here it is, as Apple says, it's all contradictory. But in the meantime, that's good education compared to what else is going on. So, so I think actually there is a lot of stuff that we can teach each other. Um, even if it's simple. Sometimes it doesn't require the theory that so many of us are really good at. So theory is very helpful. Interesting, you held up the Rethinking Schools publication. Um, there is a, a genre that's, that's arisen over the last several months of publications that, that are, and I don't mean this as a, as a swipe to Rethinking Schools because we've done it ourselves at NEPC, um, it's, it's taking our pre-existing ideas about what's good and marketing them in the context of the pandemic, right? So we're seeing that with, the, um, with our Think Tank Review Project. We're seeing these charter school pieces coming out. You know, let, me, let me point you to all the charter schools doing great things and responding in ways that, that the conventional public schools haven't been able to or didn't respond. And right. wouldn't it be great if we could all learn from these charter schools. The piece we put out that I'm remembering was pointing to some community schools that are doing really great things because they're really well positioned to work with their, sort of what you were just saying, right? Working with their communities, and Francesca, what you were saying, working with their communities um, in ways that they already had, you know, established bonds and established mechanisms um, um, and relationships. Um, and in my mind, that's when, certainly when we put that out, it makes, it makes perfect sense that we should be pointing out how well these schools responded to the new context and served their communities. I imagine to charter school advocates, it's sort of a similar thinking. Well, look at our great schools. Let's make sure everyone knows what's going on. Um, I haven't read the Rethinking Schools piece, but I'm guessing it's more aligned with what we've put out <laughs> than, than that. But yeah, it, definitely. But, and in fact, some of the, we, we've recognized as part of our Schools of Opportunity project, a couple of community schools that are also charter schools, right? So that it overlaps, um, that have, that have been, done, done a good job responding. Um, and um, I mean, in, in answer to Anna's question, yes, there are clearly are schools doing really good things. The, the problem is in this polarized world, I think we just have a hard time seeing um, 
the perspective, you know, we're seeing everything through a pre-existing lens of what's good. Um, and yes, it's a, it's a very, it's a growing genre if anyone wants to, to join the literature. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing amount of literature that's coming out on the, aren't we doing it well um, front. I wish there were, I wish there were as many schools doing it well as there are publications about schools doing it well. But <laughs> so, um, so we have just enough time for each, each one of you to uh, wrap up. There was a question asked at the end of the last uh, panel that I think would be a really good prompt for a wrap up, which is for the for the researchers out there, particularly the young researchers out there. What what do you think of as a good um, thing for them to be working on? A good study, a good um, analysis, something that they should be thinking about um, to contribute in light of what we've been talking about. Yeah, I, I just threw that at you at the last minute. So. There's so much. I mean, you're talking to, <laughs> to researchers, right? So um, I think, you know, something Michael said really has, it resonated with me about the interdisciplinary, the, the need to get out of our silos. I think it's imperative for students who are, who are thinking about doing research to read outside their particular discipline. Now I say this because my training was in educational psychology. The history of educational psychology is very colorblind, very white, and there was very limited space for discussions of race. Um, and that's the center of my work. And, and so using that as an example, I think it's imperative that we read outside of what we are trained to be reading because we have so much to gain from it. I, I think it's very powerful when you start to see these different themes um, with people who had, you know, they're historians or they were trained in sociology and you start to see these, these patterns and sometimes you see things that are quite dissonant because of the lens in which they're viewing these things. Um, and so I, I think that whatever it is that they're passionate about, that there is a space for that because I do feel that we are at a tipping point in a very good way. I, I think we're seeing people mobilize in ways we haven't in a very long time. Um, the youth activism, so the district I'm working with in California has students on their panel and they are vocal and they are fierce in a very good way. I mean, I, I just feel that you, I think we tend to go into our fields because we're passionate about something, but we can't limit it to the things that are handed to us, right? I, I think we have to go outside and learn. And if we have questions, one good example is critical race theory. I was not trained in CRT. And I think we have a lot to learn from CRT that can help us make sense of the world. I think there's many other examples I, I can provide. So that's, and I went too long. So that's all I'll say. <laughs> I'll just say um, uh, yes, um, but uh, it seems to me that it's it's too broad a question, um, and I think it would be arrogant for me or anybody else to say here's what you should be working on. But I do think the questions are important. That is, what is it that this contributes, and not not only though it is important to the field. What does it contribute to the larger assemblage of issues that we've been talking about? And if you can be secure in doing that, then that's the first step. So. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that response. And, and thank you both. And uh, a warm thank you to all of our attendees, um, for those who asked the questions and, and participated in the chat and those who are just joining us um, for, for, um, for the learning. Um, Francesca and Michael, you're both so, uh, so, such amazing thinkers and I really appreciate you um, sharing this time with us and um, sharing these thoughts with us. Uh, I, I look forward to continuing to learn from both of you um, and um, for, for everyone uh, with us, including both of you, we have one more panel discussion 
um, today. Um, David Garcia and Lori Shepard will be joining us at 3 p.m. our time and mountain time, so 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Um, and I think probably with, with a conversation that overlaps somewhat uh, with this, but really is prompted by these calls that we're seeing about how we need to swing into action to address the, the COVID slide and what that means and how people are pushing on that. And to be honest, I think what we're seeing is something very similar to what I just was talking about, which is people using the COVID slide so to speak, to argue for what they already were arguing for. Um, and sort of using that moment of crisis to say, now we need to do what, what, uh, what I think is best. Um, so uh, David and Lori will uh, engage us in that conversation. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you in uh, 90 minutes. Thank you. Bye.